Magellan lost his second ship, but this time it wasn't due to weather. The San Antonio headed back to Spain in an act of rebellion. It was a devastating blow. The San Antonio was carrying most of the provisions that Magellan was relying on for the journey ahead. He ordered the remaining three ships to proceed northwest by west. It was a terrifying journey through a strait we now know to be 530 kilometers long. It took 38 frustrating days of searching before Magellan finally got the news he'd been waiting for. Ahead was the open sea. He had found the fabled passage. The captain general wept for joy and called it Cape Deseado, for we had been desiring it for a very long time. In that proud moment, Magellan must have realized, without doubt, he now stood shoulder to shoulder with his great boyhood heroes, Columbus and Vasco da Gama. His dreams had come true. Even in this moment of personal triumph, Magellan could hardly have guessed at the historic significance of finding the passage. For 400 years, his route, the Magellan Strait, would be the major shipping route through to the Pacific. It was only bettered when the Panama Canal was blasted out of the land in 1914. Yes, it was an astonishing discovery, but Magellan and his men hoped it was the prelude to something even greater the western route to the riches of the Spice Islands. On November the 28th, 1520, Magellan led the fleet north. The weather was good and the sea so calm, he named it the Pacific, the peaceful sea. The sky was huge and the horizon stretched endlessly. Even the sky at night was different. These God-fearing sailors wondered at the Southern Cross and noticed something strange in the heavens. There are several small stars clustered together in the manner of two clouds. And in the middle of them are two stars, not very bright, and they move slightly. Nearly 400 years later, these stellar clusters were identified as two of the closest galaxies to the Earth. 
the Magellanic clouds have helped astronomers work out the scale of the universe and witness the death of stars. On December the 18th, 1520, the fleet turned northwest into the heart of the Pacific. Unknowingly, Magellan had just made a serious error. He thought it was within three days sailing of the Spice Islands. But that belief was based on maps of the then known world. And these were based on the work of the second century scholar Ptolemy, who estimated the circumference of the Earth to be about 29,000 kilometers. The Captain General was about to discover the hard way that Ptolemy was out by over 11,000 kilometers. This missing area, 28% of the world's circumference, is the Pacific. Magellan was leading his men into a vast, empty ocean. On the modern now Victoria, our captain, Jose, has some idea of what that journey must have been like. You've crossed the Pacific many times. You've crossed the Pacific on here. You're trying to think, you, you of anybody would understand what Magellan's men would have gone through to have entered the biggest ocean in the world and not known how big it was and just day after day after day of uncertainty. I can imagine how much they suffer and what went through their minds. Not knowing when they were going to reach any land, if they were going to reach any land. So uh, it must have been very, very tough on them. And, and probably the weaker men must have uh, felt that, you know, the, the head was going off and the lack of food, the, the food diminishing, the scurvy setting in, the water lousy, foul, because the wood contaminates the water. It must have been very, very hard on them. But obviously, the, the command of Magellan is a strong man and uh, very tough with the crews. They probably kept the, the whole thing going on. Uno, dos, tres. As the weeks passed, the emaciated crews began to starve again. Their accounts make disturbing reading. We ate the oxides, which were under the main yard, so that the yard should not break the rigging. And we ate old biscuits turned to powder, all full of worms and stinking of urine which the rats had made on it. And of the rats, which were sold for half an ecu apiece, some of us could not get enough. I believe that never more will any man undertake to make such a voyage. By late January 1521, Magellan had led the fleet northwest across thousands of kilometers of open ocean without relief. We saw no land except two small uninhabited islands where we found only birds and trees and there is no place for anchoring because no bottom can be found. Months later, with no land in sight, even Magellan must have had doubts. But almost five months and 20,000 kilometers after they exited the Straits, they finally made landfall at about 10 degrees north of the equator in a place we now call the Philippines. In an astonishing feat of navigation, Magellan had led the fleet to safety. The Spice Islands were now no more than a few days sail to the south. It seemed that his great gamble would pay off. The islands of the Philippines must have looked like paradise. 
It was fresh water, lush rainforests filled with fruit, and the local people seemed to welcome them. Magellan set about securing the route to the Spice Islands by claiming the Philippines for Spain. His most effective tool was Christianity. He knew that to convince these people to adopt this religion, he had to persuade them that it's worth their while to do so. One of the arguments he used was of the invincibility which would derive from it. And this invincibility was demonstrated by the strength of his armament. The blast of the cannons terrified the natives and gave a measure of his power. When attempting and succeeding in baptizing and Christianizing the local inhabitants, Magellan is at the same time ensuring that through this religious conversion, they implicitly accept their status as subordinate to the Spanish crown, seen here as the ultimate symbol of worldly authority and religious virtue. It's really like tight, structured framework as which to oh, live yes. by, live by these rules. Yeah. Live by these rules, obey to these people, submit yourself to these people, and you will be invincible. So would it have been perhaps uh, like colonization? The very beginnings, the foundations of colonization. It would have taken many decades for the following Spanish fleets to effectively transform the Philippines into a, a, a Spanish colony. But that's, that was the foundation upon which they built. Confident of his faith and his invincible weaponry, the Captain General made a fateful decision. To show his support for a local chief, he decided to attack the rival chief of Mactan Island, Lapu Lapu, who had refused to be baptized into the Christian faith. Aboard the Victoria, on the evening before the attack, his men were relaxed and confident. on Mactan Island, Lapu Lapu was taking Magellan's threats seriously. He summoned his most ferocious warriors and invoked the gods of war. The events that followed are replayed every year in the place where Magellan and Lapu Lapu confronted each other. It was a clash of cultures and religion. For Filipinos, it's come to symbolize the struggle for independence. Before the battle, Magellan sent emissaries across these peaceful waters to try to get Lapu Lapu to submit to Christianity and to Spanish rule. Once more, he refused. And so at dawn on the 27th of April, 1521, Magellan and 50 of his men arrived on the beach at Mactan to do battle against Lapu Lapu and a thousand of his men. Although those heavily outnumbered, Magellan felt certain of victory because of his superior Spanish weapons and his armor. In fact, he was so confident of victory that he'd given a direct order to his other captains to not get involved in the fighting. But he made a fatal mistake. He'd arrived at low tide, which meant his ships were right out there in the deep water. And Magellan and his men had had an exhausting half mile wade through the shallows. And his cannon were out of range. As the battle ensued, Magellan's men soon started running out of ammunition. And Lapu Lapu's men surged forward. He spotted Magellan. 
One of them with a large javelin thrust it into his left leg.